morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Bentley, and I'm the Marketing and Advertising and Wellness Manager here at Tucson Medical Center. And you have tuned in, if you are here tonight, if you're watching us on Facebook or if you're watching us on the webinar, you have tuned in to the Healthy Pregnancy and COVID, What You Need to Know Town Hall. And we have assembled uh, a wide variety of experts and new moms and moms-to-be that are going to share information about how to have a healthy pregnancy during these crazy times. Because we all know, all of our people here, that having a baby is one of the most exciting times of your life. It really is. Um, but we also know that the world has gone crazy. It is upside down. And having a baby in these times is totally different. But I will tell you one thing that hasn't changed is that our babies keep coming. In fact, TMC delivered more than 5,000 babies in the past 12 months. So while medical care and, and isolation and other things may have put a damper on some of the things that we do here in the community, it hasn't stopped babies. So we wanna get you the information about healthy pregnancy, healthy vaccination, and what you need to do to have a healthy pregnancy. So we're gonna have a, a couple of house cleaning items. You can answer, you can ask a question uh, down below. There's a Q&A for our um, folks that are watching live tonight. If you are watching on a, a subsequent showing, whether on Facebook or YouTube or one of our other channels, you can leave a question in the comments section and one of our experts will get it for you. Um, I wanna go around real quick and introduce everybody, uh, our panelists. I wanna say hello to Dr. Gail D, who is an OB at uh, Genesis OBGYN Crossroads. She's also TMC's chief of staff and she's one of my favorite people here at TMC. Dr. Dean, hello, how are you? I'm well, thank you, and happy to be here. Thank you, what are you looking forward to tonight? I'm looking for the opportunity to engage with our community and answer some questions that they may have to help enlighten them and make them feel more comfortable about the situation so that they are prepared and understand this medical urgency that we have in our community. Great, thank you. I want to say hello to Dr. Eric Labor, who is an MBA and also a TMC1 pediatrician. Dr. Labor, hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. Dr. Labor was on our other, um, uh, our most recent uh, vaccinations for kids between five and 11. It's good to see you again. She's a wealth of information, thank you. Uh, hi, Karen Jones. Karen Jones is a public health nurse at Pima County Public Health. Karen, what about you tonight? What are you looking forward to? I'm really happy to be here. I'm actually looking forward to hearing what everyone else is saying. I love talking and giving out information. And as Dr. Dean said, also making people comfortable. Um, but I'm also interested in what everyone else is saying. Great, thank you. Hi, Rebecca Rivera, how are you? She's a midwife at Marana Healthcare. There she is. Hi. Rebecca, where are you going? Oh, I'm just, I'm watching my kids soccer practice. So oh. Mom and midwife <laughs> in the community. Well, great, we're glad to see you. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. I wanna say hi to Catherine Teachea, uh, who is my friend here at TMC. She's an RN. And she's a mom to be. Catherine, how are you tonight? What are you looking forward to? Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, as a nurse, I'm I'm definitely excited to empower people, um, pregnant people, to get vaccinated and um just yeah, looking forward to the questions and hearing how our community is feeling right now. Great, thank you. Myra Jeffrey, hello. Myra is a new mom. When did you uh when did you uh deliver? When was your baby? Four or five months ago, you said? Yes, uh, Max was born in August, so five months ago. Five months ago, and, and, and Myra is a, is a program coordinator at Pima County Health Department. And Jessica Leonard, welcome back. Jessica was on our most recent uh, town hall as well. She's a fourth grade teacher at Butterfield Elementary. How's school going, Jessica? Uh, you know, we're just kind of trying to truck along, make everything keep working. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 some of my most favorite people are um, uh, here, and teachers, healthcare workers, you guys are doing such great work. I mean, I want to celebrate you here. I want to thank you very much for being here. I know you do hard work every day and it's, it's, I'm looking forward to Karen. Thank you for saying that. I'm looking forward to learning a lot too. Um, we did say this, we all know that COVID is here. We could talk about numbers for the next hour or two about how Omicron is spreading across the United States and Pima County. We're not going to do that. We're not going to dive deep into numbers. We know it's here. We know that it's affecting our lives. But Dr. Dean, you know, so many people that find themselves pregnant are wondering, am I at risk for COVID? What do I need to do? You recently said that you're, you know, you're taking on a lot of new patients that find themselves 
pregnant. What are you telling your patients about being healthy during these COVID, times of COVID? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. Um, what I normally like to share with my patients and I like to share with everyone here today is that when we are pregnant, um, we are immunocompromised actually. Our immune system is not as strong as it is at other times in our lives. And that being said, we're at risk for um, worse infection if we are to get an infection. So with the onset of COVID, we like to enlighten our patients and make them empowered and aware that really we want them to get vaccinated before pregnancy, during the pregnancy, as soon as they can to decrease their risk of severe disease. And if you don't mind, I'd like to elaborate on when I say severe disease, if you don't mind, if that's okay. Please do. I, we, you know, I think the more information we can get these, uh, our audience today, that's perfect. Yeah, so severe disease is, um, number one, just having to be in the hospital for the disease. Um, a hospitalization is a acute situation that, meaning right on the spot, something happening suddenly that makes you so sick that you have to actually be there. So that's number one. Number two is that um, it also can include having an intensive care unit admission. Now, I think a lot of us know intensive care unit is for more um, people that are even sicker than the average ill patient in the hospital. Those are our really critically ill patients. And also you're at risk for getting intubated, which is a tube down your throat um, to help you to breathe and sustain you for life. You also are at risk um, for preterm delivery. If you get COVID, you're at risk for preeclampsia, you're at risk for stillbirth, and you know, you're at risk for being not well enough to even recognize and see your baby because you have to get delivered in an urgent situation and you're so ill that you're not in tuned enough and see not see your baby until hopefully you recover from your condition. And so this is a very serious situation, but there is opportunity for you to make a difference. It's opportunity for you to be proactive and try to protect yourself. And as a new parent, our ultimate responsibility is protect our child too. Thank that's you. a that's a strong and Dr. Dean, thank you. I always admire, I admire your passion for for uh, new parents. And um, you you talk about um, things that that uh, parents to be uh, new parents can do to keep themselves safe. Karen, I want to ask you. Um, you know, we said that Omicron is, is coming over, has just spread over our community. I think it's, it's, upwards, it's more than 95% of the cases are Omicron. Um, and it primarily affects people in their 20s and 30s and early 40s. You know, I mean, it's, it's right in that, the age that our demographic of people that are also having children. So what are you recommending and how, what are you advocating for your folks when you uh, meet with them about their pregnancy and, and how to keep healthy during this time? There's so many things that we can do right now to protect ourselves. Um, one is to wear a mask if you can't socially distance, which everyone's heard some of this information before, social distance meaning at least six feet away from someone for not too many minutes at a time, having those masks on. Um, thinking about how you want to deal with any kind of indoor um, gatherings. Do you want to go to an indoor gathering right now? Is there a way that it can be moved outdoors? Um, many of my families have been doing uh, the best job that they can, having their little parties out at the Ramadas at the parks. Um, I think that's a great idea. It's a, maybe a little chilly today, but no one told me they had a party today. Um, so thinking about those kind of things, there's different kind of masks that we could go into if we wanted. And then, just as Dr. Dean said, getting those vaccines. Um, it is a very common question as I start working with a new um, pregnant mom in my job. It's one of the first questions that's asked. What do you recommend as far as the vaccine? And I always say, you're gonna, if you're listening to me, I got my vaccines as soon as I could and I 
I recommend that to everyone to get their vaccines as soon as they can. And if you can't at this moment, the masking, social distance, thinking about being outside and the good ventilation there are the, the best next steps. Great, thank you. And I, Karen talks about the weather today and it's, it is very cold here in Tucson on February 2nd. So if you're watching this after February 2nd, just know that we were all freezing in our houses. And so if you see this, know that that was a true statement. Um, Myra, I want to ask you, uh, Karen talked about vaccines and, and your, tell me your, your, uh, your baby's name, Max, did you say? Max, Maximilian. And, and Max was born in August. So tell me, what was that decision like when you, do you, you know, to, to find out you're pregnant, you got to go through COVID. Are you making a decision about vaccinations? What, what went through your head at that time? You know, uh, I, I waited. So I got vaccinated back in April. It was basically, it worked out that it was um, right around the time that it became public for everybody to go and get their vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, so I waited until I had just hit the second trimester. I miss, I met that, um, that 20 week mark where you get your anatomy scan and I made sure everything was perfectly fine with the baby. Um, just in case there was, uh, there was still too early, right? Um, there was a lot of misinformation going around about the vaccine and how it would affect a, a newborn baby. Um, so I waited uh, at that point and I knew it was going to be a, really the perfect, the ideal point to get vaccinated. Um, and then back in April, like I said, it, it was perfect time with uh, the, it was not uh, a peak of the virus circulating at that moment. It was before Omicron. Um, and that really uh, enabled me to, to continue the quarantine, um, really just uh, focusing on my baby and knowing that I, I made a, uh, the right choice for myself, that I, I felt safer um, with people coming along. And even um, I didn't, I opted out of a baby shower, but, um, you know, works, uh, wor people at work still wanted to do a little get together. Um, and then also knowing that I made that choice for my baby as well, because there's been evidence, uh, you know, that, that uh, my immune response to the vaccine was going to protect my baby as soon as he was born. So that, that was what was going on in my head. Well, thank you for that. I want to circle back on, but I want to bring in Catherine really quickly. You, you are pregnant. You, you're due in two weeks. Dr. Dean is your OB. Is that right? Am I, so Dr. Dean, how is she doing? Is she doing all right? She's He's doing great. Great, great. So, Catherine, you are, you're due in two weeks. You're a nurse here at TMC. I know how busy you are. What's, what kind of decision did you and your family have to make, you know, about, you know, not only your, your new baby's health, but your health and your family's health? You're, you, you know, you work in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important industry, but in an exposed industry. Yeah. Yeah. Working in a hospital setting, of course, makes, you know, makes me worried that if I go into a patient's room, my exposure risk. Um, <clears throat> but I think that a lot of pregnant people, they're, you're just worried about anything, right? Anything changing, you know, if I do get a vaccine, if I don't. And so obviously I went to Dr. Dean who said, absolutely, you should get it. I couldn't be happier with the fact that I got it. <clears throat> I actually felt I'm less sick after the booster than I did the first two. And I'm like, did my baby take, you know, away some of that, you know, headache that I'm supposed to get no. anyways, but, um, you know, just feeling even safer, right? Because now I am in the hospital. I have such a higher risk of being um, exposed. And so I, I feel like I have this sort of safety net over myself and not only just listening to Dr. Dean, of course, but also doing research and understanding that really that everything shows that the benefits are just far outweighing and I haven't had any side effects. I mean, I've, I've felt great the whole time. Um, and having worked in the hospital, um, observed or, or heard through experiences that we have patients here who have to be intubated, pregnant patients who have to be intubated and are not part of their pregnancy of part of their delivery. And that terrifies me. Um, I don't, I want to be there. I want to hold my baby right when it comes out of me and um, to hear of moms that are intubated in our ICU that then have to go to a procedure room to have a C-section who don't get to experience their birth, their baby isn't part, um, doesn't get to experience it with them, right? That's such a bonding moment. And so 
um, I just feel like it's so important for me, not only, of course, you know, to want to survive this COVID outbreak, of, but if I if I were a person who had it, just how upsetting it would be to me that I wasn't, I didn't get to be part of that birth process that I think is so special, so. Right, thank you for that. I, I think, you know, so many people work in, an, in a, you know, they're, they're working in a community where they have to be around other people. And, you know, you're, you're you know, obviously in a high risk, but I think people that are watching today would, would identify with that. They have to be out in the community and they're nervous about it. I wanted to circle back and maybe Dr. Dean or, or uh, Karen or, or one of our, our baby deliverers can answer this. Um, there, was a, there was a mention of a risk of uh, associated with unvaccinated pregnant women. And if they, if they uh, contract COVID, what are the risks to vaccinated women who contract COVID while they're pregnant? I'm Dr. Dean or uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you've had patients that have contracted COVID while they're pregnant. Is there, is there an increased risk at that? Maybe Dr. Dean, and then I'll go back to Rebecca and you can answer that too. Well, the, I think of the vaccine as like this. Um, when you go outside, if you lived, if people that didn't live in Tucson where we have nice, beautiful weather, if it was a uh, hundred below, 30 below, you would bundle up, you would put on all your gear, put on a hat, put on gloves, put on a thick coat to try to protect yourself. And that is similar to what the vaccine does. It tries to protect you and help you to decrease the effects of the virus. The, your bundling up keeps you, keeps, tries to protect you from the effects of the cold weather. So does it mean that you won't feel the cold? No. Does it, if you have the vaccine, does it mean that you won't get the virus? No, it does not. What it means is that you ideally, if you get the virus, COVID, then your effects and response to that will be lessened, meaning that ideally you probably would maybe feel like you have a cold um, and you won't end up in that severe range what we had spoke of earlier. Thank you. Rebecca, have any of your uh, new parents-to-be or any of your patients uh, contracted COVID? Uh, do you have any insights on that? Any advice you can give? Yeah, we've had, um, you know, several patients now um, coming into this third year, as you said, who have come in contact with people with COVID and who have contracted COVID themselves. And um, like Dr. Dean said, um, it's a it's a something that's not going to stop you from getting contracting the virus, but it is going to decrease the effect that it has on both yourself and the pregnancy. And so the people that we see in that in the ICU and intubated with the tubes and not able to see their baby, those people are typically the unvaccinated. So mm -hmm. the vaccine um, is going to hopefully do its job and keep you out of that category. Of course, nothing's perfect, but that's the goal. Thank you. Dr. Labor, I'm going to ask you a question. And, and, and I, um, Catherine mentioned that maybe her symptoms were lessened because of her boost, maybe because she was hoping because the baby took some of that away. Um, is there any, any, any science or any proof that, um, that the vaccine on a, on a, on a, on a parent to be uh, flows through to the, to the unborn, to the newborn, to the, to the, um, to their um, baby? Yeah, there is. Um, so there are there is some research suggesting that there is transplacental crossing of antibodies, so maternal antibodies, either um, from moms who've been vaccinated um, as well as moms who've contracted COVID. There's there's also a question, and I, I'm curious um, if 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 a, if a, a parent to be gets vaccinated while they're pregnant, does that then flow through to the child and and give them some natural some yeah. immunity? Yeah, it, it seems like it is doing that. So that's a, another reason to get vaccinated to protect your baby, um, you know, when they're born too, because they will get some of the maternal antibodies that way. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Jessica, I want to ask you, you got a bunch of fourth graders and I know that they're big brothers and big sisters. Uh -huh. um, I don't, you know, know if, if uh, you're seeing any of your, you know, your parents of those kids, if they're you know, going through this, what are you recommending for those kids that are big brothers and big sisters for their folks as the school district? Are you doing anything in your classroom for those, those big brothers, big sisters to be? Yeah, well, um, 
I make a really big deal out of washing your hands, making sure that you're um, not touching your face or your nose, your mouth, anything like that. Um, we don't have an enforced mask mandate right now, but mm -hmm. I would say that um, a good half of my students are choosing to come to school wearing masks. And I would definitely say those who do are the ones who have younger brothers and sisters at home. So. Gotcha. Well, I, I laugh because my grandma Bentley was a school nurse and she said exactly that. Cover your cough. Don't touch your face. Yeah. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> yeah. Wash your hands. All those things. I think that we're all we all have a grandma Bentley somewhere that told us those things. And here we are in 2022 realizing mm -hmm. that they were pretty smart. I think I'm turning my students into Grandma Bentleys because when <laughs> the student sneezes, everyone screams, go wash your hands. <laughs> that is that is so good. I think that's, if people look back in 30, 40 years, we will have figured that out, that that is, is absolutely the case. Um, we have a question, and, and maybe uh, uh, Karen or, or Dr. Dean. Um, so people are, you know, they're obviously concerned about the severity of their COVID um, if they have COVID, you know, and the severity of that and the likelihood of preterm, you know, delivering preterm or, you know, uh, in, um, you know, uh, injury to the to the newborn is Dr. Dean or Rebecca, are you seeing that as are, are, are the, does the severity relate to a lot more uh, to the likelihood of a preterm delivery? Dr. Dean and then I'll Rebecca. Okay. Uh, yes, and unfortunately, uh, when patient has severe disease, it sometimes comes down to, to try to help the mother, um, a delivery is indicated, and sometimes the baby uh, is, shows signs of compromise. Um, we have testing that we do for external monitoring when we're assessing uh, infant or fetus inside of the womb. And there is uh, something called a non-stress test where we look at the assessment of that. And sometimes the evaluation and, and readings identify that the baby is suffering and compromised such that um, it warrants, and the mother is so ill that it warrants um, delivery early or sometimes just the stress of the infection causes a mother to go into preterm labor. Both of those things can happen. Hey, Rebecca, are you seeing the same thing on your deliveries over there? Uh, right. So, yeah, same thing. And if you think a, I think a good analogy is um, when you're on the airplane, your instinct, of course, if something is going wrong, is to give your get your child the oxygen before you put it on yourself. Right? I remember sitting in an airplane and thinking, well, that's crazy. I wouldn't put my mask on. I would get my oxygen to my baby. But the truth is, if I pass out, no one's going to take care of my baby. So as Dr. Um, Dean was saying, we it's a it's a very, um, you know, it's a balance and we have to think of both the, the moms or the, the pregnant person and the baby. And so um, doing those screenings that Dr. Dean was talking about helps us determine, you know, what is safer you know, the pregnant person, what is safe for the baby, and then ultimately a decision that can save both lives is, is the goal. Great. Um, here's a question we get a lot, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch this up a little bit. So Myra, Max was born five months ago. Um, what was it like? Could your family come in, your partner, could they come in with you? And then I, Catherine, I'm going to switch to you and ask you the same question in just a minute. What was it like the day that Max was born? Um, I actually delivered Max at a freestanding birth center. So, okay. so the risks there were really low in what I'm saying is that I, I went into labor about two in the morning or, you know, sometime after midnight, there was no one there. No one else was there. It was in a hospital where there was other patients or um, a waiting room or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was just me and my two midwives. Um, so my husband was there and, and that was my delivery team. Um, so relatively low risk. Catherine, what kind of plans are you making? We know you're doing a couple of weeks and what kind of, what kind of uh, plans are you making? So I'm going to deliver at TMC, of course, and our, um, our visitor policy is two unique visitors. So I plan to have my mom and my husband with me. Does, uh, do you know what are the specific rules on uh, people in the delivery room at TMC? Because uh, we can speak to that one for sure. 
Yeah, two unique visitors. Two unique yeah. visitors. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, is that about what is what are your restrictions or your um, uh, limits at Marana Healthcare? Um, so we deliver at Northwest Women's Center, and it's okay. the same one uh, person support person the entire state, and then one person the entire labor, and then once delivery is um, you know performed, then um, routine visiting hours are 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, great, thank you, um, Karen. I want to ask you, you know, so once so once we have the the bundle of joy in person, live and in person, what kind of advice? There's a there's a couple of questions like, what do I do? You know about breastfeeding and how do I keep my baby healthy when I'm, you know, when the baby's home? Um, do, are there any concerns about that? What kind of advice are you offering your new moms, your new parents? Well, everyone's heard breastfeeding is best. Um, and the baby's probably getting some antibodies through the breast milk if the mom's been vaccinated or has already had COVID in the recent 90 days to six months or so, the mom will be passing some antibodies um, to the baby. So that's number one, that's the best way. And then trying to limit visitors, which I remember stories. I was born in the winter in Connecticut and everyone always had a cold or the flu. So I didn't have birthday parties very often in the winter time. And it's kind of like thinking about what can I do to protect my family? And it's avoiding people that could possibly be bringing the virus to you. Um, one of my moms um, allowed visitors who only wore masks and said, you can't take your mask off and kiss the baby, even grandma. Um, so it's, it's a different kind of preparation really and preparing your family for what your rules are gonna be to protect yourself in your little cocoon for those first few weeks. It's, uh, it's different than it was a few years ago. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience, and I, I think that one of our, our um, Dr. Dean or Dr. Labor, I'll ask you first. Um, so is there any research on baby aspirin prescribed um, to pregnant women? Have you seen that? And then I'll circle back to, I'll circle back to Dr. Dean and ask the same question in just a minute. Yeah, I actually am not that familiar with, so I think I have to- Okay, all right. Dr. So Dean. Dr. Dean, are you, are you prescribing um, um, uh, baby aspirin at all? Um, we have on certain occasions prescribed baby aspirin to um, mothers that had contracted COVID. We have not done it on a consistent basis. This is fairly new um, data that is coming out. Um, and so there is some thought that um, giving a patient baby aspirin can help with uh, placental insufficiency, which we do sometimes for other indications of placental insufficiency, which is like when we expect a person has a risk of something called preeclampsia. Um, and so that is the school of thought of giving the um, baby aspirin, but it is not a standard of practice at this point. What is what is the definition of that word that you just said? Um, yeah, what does that mean? Preeclampsia is where you have uh, protein urea, meaning excess amount of protein in your urine. Mm -hmm. It oftentimes is associated with elevated blood pressures and can result in a um, effect on the liver enzymes and platelets. And it can lead into something called eclampsia, which is actually seizures in pregnancy. Okay, and you mentioned the intubation and intubated. I, I, I think we work, many of us work at a hospital we might know what that is, but what is ex exactly does that mean when you, if you're intubated? Are you asking me? Yeah, Dr. Dean. Okay, I don't want to hog that. I don't want to be. Well, here. So Dr. Dean, I here. Catherine, is, she's, she's going to be off on PTO in a couple of weeks. Let's ask her, Catherine, what does that mean? <laughs> So where you aren't able to breathe on your own. So there is a tube that's put down your throat and then you're hooked up to a machine that then breathes for you. And when you're intubated, um, almost everyone is sedated, right? So you're not aware of what's going on around you. That's sort of the big piece of it as well. Right, right. Tim, um, can, we yeah. explain, can we explain what placental insufficiency is as well? Yeah, but, um, yes, I, I don't remember who said that. Was that Dr. Dean or was it? Go ahead. You can, you can do you, Rebecca, do you have some insight on that? Why don't yeah. we? I just, it's a, it's, a, it's a big fancy word. And so I just want to make sure people understand what we're talking about. So the placenta, you know, basic, basically is the baby's lifeline. It connects 
from the mom to the baby through the umbilical cord. Okay, so that placenta acts like a filter and it exchanges oxygen between mom and baby. And when we have um, situations where the placenta is not working well, we call that placental insufficiency. And okay. when Dr. Dean is talking about preeclampsia and um, how that would affect, um, you know, the, how the blood is clotting and stuff like that, that's where the baby aspirin comes in. And that's the thought behind the, the baby aspirin and COVID. So Great, hopefully that you. helps everyone understand. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Dr. Labor, um, a big a big push here at, at TMC is healthy pregnancy, and I know that you um, you work your pediatrician, but you also work with with moms and families. What advice would you give? I mean, if people that we have people that are watching today that aren't pregnant, maybe perhaps they're trying, um, but they're also worried about maintaining their health. What what advice would you give to a, a family planning uh, to become pregnant? Um, so definitely getting vaccinated is the best thing that you can do um, for family planning. I know there's been um, kind of some false information saying that it makes uh, conceiving difficult or getting pregnant difficult, but it, that's inaccurate. Um, and it's really the best thing that you can do um, for your baby um, and for the health of your family. Are you, are you recommending boosters for people that just, for yes, new moms? If yes, okay. if you qualify for boosters. And um Sort of to what Catherine was saying, I do see um, patients that were born preterm um, because mom contracted COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so hard to see the moms when they couldn't hold their baby, you know, that yeah. it's very hard. So I think it's the best thing that you can do for that experience and for the best thing for the baby. I, I love over at, in the maternity labor and delivery, they, they call it your birthday, two words. It's, it's, a, it's one of the most magical days you'll have. And they celebrate, they really truly celebrate it over there. And I, I love that. And that's, you're right, that's sad that um, that, that has to happen. So yeah. that's why we're here. I just wanna do a quick reset. We're, um, we're about 30 minutes in. Um, you're watching the, the Healthy Pregnancy and COVID, What You Need to Know. This is a town hall presented in conjunction with Tucson Medical Center and Pima County Health Department. And we have a panel of experts here that are answering your questions. Uh, perhaps you're watching it live. You can answer or ask a question in the Q&A below. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube after February 2nd of 2022, I want you to know that you can put a question in the comment section of whatever platform you are. We'll get an alert and we can have one of our experts or one of our medical professionals in the community answer those questions too. So even if you're seeing this after uh, uh, it's live, don't worry, we can still get those questions answered. Um, you know, I, I want to, I'll open it up and I'll, I'll maybe I'll start with um, you, Myra. Um, there's so many myths about COVID and pregnancy. What was what were some of the things that you had to deal with when you found out you're pregnant that you maybe found out weren't true or that you were worried about at the beginning? Uh, well, we talked about my decision to get vaccinated um, and sort of the myths that were going around uh, then um, during my first trimester that it would affect the baby and the growth and um, lead to potential side effects uh, that would affect the baby. And as a new mom, we're, we're already uh, in, uh, like we discussed in the very beginning of this, it, it's a really emotional and exciting time, but it's also a really vulnerable time, uh, especially for a new mom that is trying to make all those decisions, not just on her own behalf or, or their own behalf, but also on the behalf of the unborn fetus. So um, kind of those things that were circulating and trying to do not just my own research, but uh, is talking to those experts, talking to um, my midwife, um, seeking guidance from uh, people that work in epidemiology and in the field with COVID response um, to really discount some of those myths. Um, which was, led to my choice, like I mentioned, uh, to get vaccinated in my uh, second trimester, um, knowing that my baby was healthy, was already healthy, was fully developed, um, and avoiding getting vaccinated in my third trimester where I felt like I was already going to be very uncomfortable. And if I did potentially have any side effects from the vaccine, that I wasn't adding that to my discomfort in the third mm -hmm. trimester. And then also um, getting boosted while I'm breastfeeding. So I'm, I'm breastfeeding my little five month old now. And I made the decision also to get boosted. And then also with that, uh, hoping that he, uh, that immunity translates to him 
as well, that immunity boost. Thank you. Karen, what kind of challenges are you facing with your, your new parents? You work with families through, at Pima County. Um, tell me the name of that program. I know you work there up till age two. Tell me the name and then what kind of challenges are you facing? What sort of uh, myths or misinformation do those families find themselves getting every day? Sure, sure. I work for Nurse Family Partnership and it's a free program for first time moms. And we enroll them during pregnancy and stay with them until their child turns two. Um, some of the things that are coming up are really just the fear of the vaccine. And as we have talked about already, the misinformation that was out there um, in the beginning and people being afraid that it's going to harm the baby in some way if they're, if they're pregnant now with their child. Um, and I think that as time goes on, these fears are gonna lessen. We're gonna see that um, we're having better outcomes and there's going to be less people being so sick as to go to ICU and be intubated. And that's really what we're striving for. You know, we don't know that the virus is ever going to really fully go away, but if we can get to a point where the vast majority of people um, have been protected against the COVID, um, we're going to have less severe outcomes being seen. Great. Thank you. Um, Catherine, I'll ask you the same question. Um, you, you are your mom, you have a three year old son at home, so you had a baby before COVID pre-pandemic and, and now pandemic, what, what sort of challenges, myths, misinformation? I, well, you work at a hospital, you must hear some, some crazy stuff every once in a while. What did you have to, to deal with your way through? Um, yeah, I don't really listen to a lot of misinformation. I just kind of let it go in one ear and out the other. Um, just because I, when, when COVID very first happened, I'm a nurse, man, currently a nursing director, but at the time I was a nurse manager when COVID very first happened. And so I was the manager of our COVID unit then um, and saw a lot of death, um, a lot of family hurt, a lot of angst. Um, and so, and also being part of the process of how we learned, at, you know, at the very beginning of what, how COVID is spread, how we're treating COVID. And so um, I think that being part of that experience has really just driven me to every day take every precaution I can, both with myself and with my family, to make sure that we're doing everything, all the things that are backed in science to help prevent us from getting COVID. And I know there's those jokes or like those memes on um, social media, like if you haven't gotten it, you're like a ninja, you know, um, dodging it. <clears throat> I still haven't got it. I'm, you know, I've, I follow the science, right? Um, and so I, I just firmly believe that doing all the things that we know, masking, hand washing, social distancing, um, and the vaccine are, are just so important. So thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask, we have some people in the, in the, that are watching, uh, from Pima County, if you could put the, uh, uh, Pima.gov slash COVID-19 link into the chat, there's some great resources there about being pregnant. Uh, uh, during these times and, and what to do and, and some resources there. So we can put that in the chat and over on, uh, on Facebook, let's do the same thing. Dr. Labor, what kind of questions are you getting uh, from your new moms or bringing the baby in? What kind of concerns are they hearing and what kind of concerns are you answering over there at your practice? Um, so one, there's kind of, there can be a fear about breastfeeding. So to know that it's completely safe and um, the um, added benefit of being vaccinated is that it you know, allows you to um, really feel more comfortable being with your baby after the delivery. Um, so a lot of moms will ask what precautions can they take um, if they did test positive. Um, and so wearing a mask, washing hands, and still promoting breastfeeding. Great. Thank you. Dr. Dean, where are you directing your patients? Who, who should they trust? I mean, obviously, they're going to trust you or their OB, but where, can, where do you send them to get trusted information? Where can people go? So I daily encourage patients to get vaccinated. And I say that you don't have to listen just to me that um, governing bodies in science recommend it. I tell them to look at the Center for Disease Control website. And as an obstetrician, I refer them to our governing bodies, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They have views and recommend the vaccine. And I even talk to them about the SMFM, which is the Society for Maternal fetal medicine. And that is high risk pregnancies. 
and they also recommend getting the vaccine. And so I normally tell them, you know, if you don't want to listen to me, it's okay. You have a right to have your opinion, but I would like for you to at least try to take a look at these, um, these informational sites that can help steer you in the right direction and at least have you be well-informed and you make a well-informed decision. Thank you, Dr. Dean. I'll, I'll let our viewing audience know if you're live on February 2nd, we did put the link to Pima.gov COVID-19 pregnancy in the chat, and we'll, it'll be over in the, uh, the Facebook side too. And then for those of you that are watching this on another platform, we'll put that link in the comments at a, at a later date. Rebecca, where are you suggesting people grab um, trusted information? Um, usually the same um, sites and uh, governing boards as Dr. Dean had mentioned. Um, some people also um, bring up a concern of like, you know, um, pharmaceutical gain and things like that. Patients are concerned about that. And when I have patients concerned about those things, I, t I tell them, go to the library, check out a basic biology book and learn about viruses and vaccines. And they've been around a long time and you can just learn how they work. And that can make you feel a little bit more comfortable. Great, thank you. Um, let's talk about the birthday. Catherine's due in a couple of weeks. Myra just delivered. Dr. Dean, you said earlier that you've delivered 270 babies this year. My goodness. <laughs> a couple of questions. So we know that that partners and, the, and Team C has their birth, uh, their visitation policy. Miranda has it. Um, the question is, a lot of people use doulas, um, and then there's midwives who we know, Rebecca, but what's the policy, um, Dr. Dean or Catherine at TMC, what's the doula policy? Do we know off the, that we could tell our, our audience? Yeah, Catherine, do you know? Okay, so um, currently TMC has a list of um, authorized doulas okay. that can serve as support individuals for the pregnant patient. And um, that is outside of their unique visitors. Okay. And what about you, Rebecca, up there at um, Northwest? So the doulas are uh, definitely welcome to come and attend the labor and the birth. Um, but after um, delivery, only one person is allowed to stay. And surprisingly, sometimes pregnant people do choose their doula to stay with them overnight at the hospital. Okay. Instead of their main support person at home. Awesome. Um, speak, speaking of, of that birthday, um, maybe, uh, Dr. Dean, real quickly, what can people expect? Their baby's coming, they call you, they call the hospital, they're going, what can they expect? What's the next 12, 24, 36 hours going to be like in this time of COVID at TMC or any hospital where they might be delivering or a place where they might be delivering? So what they can expect is that we wanted to try to normalize it as much as possible. We recognize that this is a special day in your lives that um, it is a memorable time and we want it to be special. So we still try to engage the patient into that experience. You know, um, for the special time of it being COVID, we do normally ask and it is a requirement that their guests be masked. Um, and we ask that the patient be masked. Now there are times that if the patient um, has difficulty with in the labor process, particularly um, the pushing aspect of labor. Um, and if it's difficult for them, then um, we as the healthcare providers are um, masked the entire time. And there are times that some women cannot mask and push at the same time. Many do not have any problems, but some do. And so we make the exception on those occasions, but we try to encourage everyone to mask so that everyone is protected as much as possible. How about you, Rebecca? Same uh, procedure up there? Yeah, pretty much okay. the same. The hospital staff is always masked, and then we do the best we can to help the, the person laboring. Right, okay. Um, Dr. Labor and then Karen is kind of the same question. Um, so we have the bundle of joy that's here. When sh does, do you recommend that, they, Dr. Labor, do, should a new parent bring their baby in any sooner or make special arrangements? I mean, now that we, there's telehealth, there's, there's, there's different types of way to see their primary care, their pediatrician. What do you recommend to new, new parents that they do to see you for that first time and then ongoing? Um, yeah, so we'll, so, um, you know, regardless of COVID status, we'll, we'll see the babies, you know, within one to two days after birth. Mm -hmm. um, and then, 
maybe be more vigilant if the mom was, you know, COVID positive, um, just monitoring the baby a little bit more closely. Um, and, you know, anyone who has any concerns about their baby can always reach out to their pediatrician um, without hesitation. They shouldn't um, feel embarrassed or scared to ask any questions. Great. And Karen, when do you uh, intersect with the families, with the new parents? When do you connect with them? Sometimes right in the delivery room after the baby's born, I get a, I get a phone call and a picture. <laughs> um, that's unusual. Usually I see them about a week out. We're primarily doing telehealth right now because they still have to, um, not have to, they want to go to their pediatricians. They want to, to go through that, those steps that have been normal in the past. And so we highly recommend that. Um, when we, before COVID, um, we were visiting about once a week and for the first couple of weeks and then twice a month after that and just really keeping touch in touch with mom and we have a really unique and special relationship today someone was unable to uh, make her appointment with me and I knew she was at work and guess what she was at work so just having that kind of relationship for two and a half years with someone they do reach out and ask questions and if I don't know or if I Think that they are not really trusting what I'm saying. I'm like, call the doctor. It's perfectly fine to call your doctor. Great. And then sometimes they come back and say that the doctor said exactly what you said. Well, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I always want to. I always want to learn if there's some other new information out there. And, you know, and I think Dr. Labor appreciates that too. You know, any anytime we can reinforce those good behaviors, um, I think that's that's important for that newborn. Um, Jessica, I'm, I'm curious. Last time we talked, we talked about vaccinating children between five and 11. Mm -hmm. And now you're a fourth grade teacher and you're dealing with big brothers, big sisters and all that. What's it like teaching right now? What keeps you going? I mean, what's what's the uh, you know, how do you keep marching forward? I mean, it's it's it must be uh, obviously it's different. So what keeps you moving forward? Um, I mean, I think it sounds really cliche, but just um, being there face to face with my students every day. Um, I think that I've never um, taken something as much for granted as I did just being with my students. And so the 18 months of remote learning for COVID really just enforces how important it is for us to all be together. And, um, you know, the thing that makes that happen is just being safe. So being vaccinated and getting your shot. So great. I, I, this is for people that are watching live. It's your last chance to ask a question. I'm going to go around and ask a, a, a last question of everybody. But your last chance, if you're watching uh, in the Q&A or you can put it in the chat, we'll see it. If you're watching after the live presentation on February 2nd, you can leave it in the comments section of whatever platform you're watching on, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. Catherine, I want to ask you, you're delivering in two weeks, February 16th. What are you nervous about? What's what's what are you what's going through your mind right now? Um, yeah, pushing with a mask on. Not looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, Dr. Dean says you're going to be good at it. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Um, <clears throat> something, I think sometimes it's a bonus to have a limited visitor um, uh, list, right? That's, uh, again, a pretty private time. And so nice to tell um, your family that you that they can't visit. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not really worried. I, I don't have anything I'm really nervous about, but I do work in the hospital. And so I feel very comfortable here because I know all the things that we do to keep our patients safe. And so I feel really confident in that. I, I, I will echo that. Um, I, I too work at the hospital and I see every day the things that they do to keep patients safe, to keep the hospital clean, um, yeah. to make sure that anybody with COVID is in a totally separate place, that people that need treatment, that need emergency care, get it and don't have to feel compromised or at risk. And that's a testament to not only uh, the people that I work with, but every healthcare professional in Tucson. Um, Myra, do you have any advice? Um, you delivered five months ago. You um, have a job, you're a program manager at Pima County. Um, do you have any advice for new parents to be or how to manage um, uh, a newborn in this, in this time of COVID? Do you have any insights, yeah. any advice? Yes, I do. Um, 
So uh, first of all, I, I mentioned I delivered at a freestanding birth center uh, back then, five months ago, there weren't really limitations on the number of people, but I still kept it small. I mentioned it was just my two midwives and my husband, that was my labor and delivery team, um, even though I did have the choice of bringing other people. Um, uh, but additionally, just one of those, this is one of those things that as a mom, uh, we can uh, do our own research, we can uh, follow our gut, and this is just one of those steps that we can take to protect ourselves and our babies. Um, but I've mentioned that because uh, when my son Max was only seven weeks old, um, he, ha he does have a, an older sister that goes to preschool. Um, she started getting a little bit of a cough and we, she ended up bringing home RSV from preschool and therefore baby Max got RSV. And for people that don't know about RSV, it's, it's not a vaccine preventable um, virus. Um, and, and I bring that up because uh, COVID is, we, ha we do have a vaccine for COVID, but we don't have a vaccine for RSV. Um, and, and my son at seven weeks old was hospitalized for two nights with RSV with um, uh, that cough, you know, um, the struggling to breathe and just those things that uh, a parent is, it's really their worst nightmare. I still get emotional when I think about that really difficult time for me and my family and for him. Um, but, but yes, uh, doing what we can to protect ourselves and our babies. And, and like I, I'm going to reiterate, uh, the, the COVID vaccine is just one of those. Let's get a look at Max. I can only see his forehead. Let's hold up. Let me see what this cute kid looks like. Max, what's going on, dude? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll remind everybody that, uh, there's, there's some information in the chat. If you're watching, uh, Pima County would love your feedback and your input. Um, there's a survey that you can fill out. If you've registered, you're going you're gonna to get an email that asks you to, uh, if you would like to participate. There's some incentives along the way. There's some gift cards and stuff like that, so you can check that out. And I want to make sure that people see that. Uh, Karen, Karen Jones, um, what, what piece of advice do you have for, for new, new parents? What, what would you like to share before we, we leave tonight? Oh, enjoy your baby. Enjoy your baby. Enjoy those first few weeks together. Be in your cocoon and just enjoy your little tiny family. Oh, that's great advice. Thank you. How about you, Rebecca? What do you what would you like to make sure that people watching tonight know and take away with them? Um, I just want people to know knowledge is power. So get out there, get information, verify information, and do what's right for your you and your family. Great, thank you. Dr. Labor, uh, any, any advice for uh, new moms, moms-to-be, people trying to, to, be, uh, to, to add an addition to their family? What do you have to say? Um, I think the best thing you can do is get vaccinated. Make sure anyone who um, comes to see the baby is vaccinated. It's the best thing that you can do. Great, thank you. I, I do know that if you are watching, and, and we've had some people behind the scenes that put um, a link to resources for pregnant people. And I do believe that has vaccine clinics, testing clinics in there. Um, you can search uh, pima.gov um, for vaccine, vaccine clinics, testing, and, and use the Google and it'll, it'll be just right in front of you. Jessica, what would you like to say? Make sure that people know before they leave tonight. Um, well, you know, I just really hope that everyone goes out and gets vaccinated and gets their kids vaccinated too. I have a little bit of a different perspective. My, the students I work with are older, but, um, vaccines are keeping kids in school. It, it's keeping kids healthy and it's keeping, um, everyone around each other. So I really hope that we can lean into that. Great. That's, that's great advice. Thank you very much. Dr. Dean, before I ask you for your final advice, there is a question that came in. Um, does, is there any research and, and maybe if, if somebody else has a, has an answer to, um, on fertility and vaccine, if I'm, if people get vaccinated, does that affect fertility at all? Uh, people trying to become pregnant, do you know? So that is one of the unfortunate, um, misnomers or wise tales that it affects fertility. It does not. Okay. Um, and so from what we know thus far. Um, and so we still encourage you actually even more. So if you are considering conceiving, trying to get pregnant, 
um, then it is encouraged to consider getting vaccinated even beforehand. Um, so, yeah. Great. That's, that's good. We, we're here to dispel myths and make sure that people uh, understand that, you know, they, they can trust science, they can trust their experts, they can ask questions. We have, we have nine experts here, but every one of you represents an institution or, um, you know, a group of people that have insights that's helpful. Um, Dr. Dean, any last advice for our people that are watching that you want to make sure that they walk away and, and have? Well, I think I want to say congratulations and thank you for the people that tuned in tonight. <laughs> you know, that's the first step, you know, like, like um, it was already referenced, knowledge is power. If you took the time to spend with us this evening to try to get more information, to learn more, to equip yourself, to maybe make you more curious, or hopefully we answered some of your questions then I say congratulations and kudos to you. And we appreciate you taking the time out to join us. Oh, Dr. Dean, thank you very much. Um, before we wrap things up, I, if, if anybody else on the panel, does anybody have something that they wanted to make sure that we know or that we, we covered? Um, there is one last question. There's, well, there's a couple and I'll make sure that we get them. Um, Jessica, um, do your kids, do they ever ask about vaccines or anything like that? Do they ever, are they ever curious about that? And how do you address that? Um, yeah, kids, I, especially around the grade level that I teach are pretty interested in it. They hear it um, with their friends, they hear it with their families, they hear it, you know, just everywhere. Um, so I just try to really allow them to have open conversations amongst themselves. Like, um, they ask each other pretty frequently if their friends are vaccinated. Um, I've been asked a couple times and I just say that it's, you know, like I do everything I can to keep myself and my family safe and that I'm hopeful that they do as well and to have those conversations with their parents about it. Great. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to say thank you so much. I've talked to you, uh, many of you offline and, and just your passion um, and your dedication to taking care of not only yourselves, but of your patients, um, of your students, of your coworkers is, is admirable. And I said it at the beginning and I mean it at the end. Um, teachers, healthcare workers, people that are of service in our community need to be celebrated. And so I celebrate all of you and a round of applause uh, from, from the gallery. So thank you very much. I'm in awe of your work every day. Um, if you've been watching live in real time on Wednesday, February 2nd, we're gonna end in just a few minutes. But if you have been watching on a platform like YouTube or Facebook after February 2nd, if you have a question, um, go ahead and put it in the comments and we'll get to it. Um, if you have a question for a specific provider, go ahead and do that. And then one of our panelists will, uh, one of us will facilitate from our panelists. So Dr. Dean, um, our OBGYN at Genesis, staff, at Genesis Crossroads and our TMC Chief of Staff, thank you very much. Dr. Labor, who is a TMC1 pediatrician, you rock. I really appreciate you. Karen Jones, a public health nurse at Pima County Public Health, thank you. Rebecca Rivera, who's a midwife at Miranda Healthcare, delivers Northwest, thank you for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. Catherine Teachea, good luck. Two weeks, my friend. You are, I can't wait to, to meet uh, the new one. So thank you. Myra Jeffrey, congratulations. Uh, Max is a rock star there. Way, way to go, little Max. <laughs> <laughs> And Jessica, thank you. you. You're a rock star teacher, man. You do good work out there. So anyway, thank you from Tucson Medical Center. My name is Tim Bentley. We really appreciate you watching and have a good night, everybody. We'll see you later. Good night. <laughs>